Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, you guys, uh, I, I know some of you have gotten the outlines and, uh, and you see what we're dealing with today. Uh, we're dealing with the book of Philippians and we'll be dealing with it for several, quite a few weeks now. It has four chapters and so we'll probably be on it for like 12 weeks or something like that. Um, trying to kind of milk a little honey out of this honey hive, uh, the book of Philippians. Tremendous book, by the way, a great book of joy. Uh, I, I know that some of you may have never read the book of Philippians before, but it, it is one of the, the great books written by Paul, um, one of those half of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. It was one of the four books that were written while he was in prison. That's, that's really interesting to know, especially when you see what he writes. Now, I mean, you know, if you... If, you, if everything's good for you, which most of us get fat, happy, and sassy when everything's good for us, I mean, we, you can't tell us anything. We don't need anything. Uh, life's great. Uh, our children are great. Well, sort of semi-great, but they do it. They're all right. And, and, you know, you got life by the tail on a downhill pool, so to speak. Uh, you can write some nice things. You can be very pleasant. You can... Uh, Goodness, boy, your hope can be high, and you can say some things that will encourage people's lives and be just so awesomely optimistic. But when things turn around, and when life isn't going like you thought at all, and the bills aren't paid, and they come in to repossess the TV, and you know what, boy, you can get bitter quick. And life doesn't look so good anymore. And, and you lose a big perspective of life. Well, I'm just saying that because, I mean, think about this. The Apostle Paul, when he's writing this book, which is called the Joy Book, I told you that last week. You could just write joy over the top of the book of Philippians because that's what it's about. It, joyful and rejoice and be glad is used about 17, 18 times in the book, and it's only four chapters long. I mean, he's just, he's just shouting Really, you almost have to read the book of Philippians with a smile on your face. Really, it's just a tremendously, if you're down, listen, I'm telling you, if you're down and you're flat and you just, man, life's a pit for you, maybe what you need is just a good dose of the book of Philippians. I'm, I'm serious. I mean, just get you, get you a good dose of Philippians because it'll bless your soul. I'm serious. And Paul's in prison when he's writing this. That's why I was saying that. He's in prison, man. I mean, he, he's in a, he's being, he's, there's a guard on this side chained to this arm and there's a guard on this side chained to this arm. And they're down in the dungeon in Rome, in the prison. He's already been in prison two years uh, on a trumped-up charge. I mean, that'll make anybody bitter, right? I didn't do it, uh, Your Honor. I mean, he was, he, man, he served two years in, in jail. And then now he's in, a, he's in prison, and, and, and they've got him chained, and he's waiting to uh, what most uh, historians believe is to have his head removed uh, that was the end of Paul. That they, most historians feel that way, that he was martyred he, you know, by his head. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul had his head chopped off. I mean, Paul was a Roman citizen, and, and you don't crucify a Roman citizen. So anyway, point being that, that this is not a happy time for him is what I'm saying. It's not good times rolling for, for the Apostle Paul, and yet he writes a book uh, to a group of Christians that, he's, that he started a church in Philippi, and it is so joyful and rejoicing and exciting, and he's basically telling, man, you've got the rest of your life to live. Learn how to enjoy life. Learn how to enjoy people. Uh, no matter what, I mean, good circumstances and problems and issues come and go, but God is there with you. And, and so it's just a tremendously great book for encouraging your life, and we'll be on it. Uh, this is the second message out of it, and you see it's talking about live life, uh, enjoy life no matter what. Well, if you're going to enjoy life no matter what, you're going to have to, to kind of get some uh, uh, essentials uh, to do this by, yeah, because most of us don't enjoy life no matter what. We enjoy life if it, if it meets what we what we perceive, you know, if it meets what I thought would be, uh, if everything's going good and right, and uh, you know, and 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 I can handle it, uh, life's good, you know. Well, if that's you, then you're not going to be enjoying very much of life, because I don't want to be like a cosmic killjoy or anything. Or and I'm really not a pessimistic person. I'm really a glasses half full kind of guy, really. Uh, 
but I, I have enough reality in me to know that most of the time life's not going like we think it ought to go, is it? Uh, our job's not, you know, everything that it, we thought it was going to be. Oh, it was fine for the first six months, but now, man, mm, those people get on my nerves. And I had to get up early in the morning and go down there and do all of that. Man, I'm getting tired of that mess. And, and people around you, I mean, people are all right for a while, but after a while, can't they just kind of grate on you a little bit? Just get kind of on that last nerve, you know, that you got? Yeah, man. I mean, even people you love can get on that last nerve. Ooh. And yeah, <laughs> I, you know I wasn't talking about you, babe. You, you know that, honestly. But, the, um, but life can really, you know, be sour, especially if you think it ought to be great all the time. And your life can be... Uh, you know, people just endure life. Is what I, I guess that's what I'm saying. They just endure life rather than enjoying life. And the Apostle Paul and God, <laughs> through him, says life is meant to be enjoyed. You know, I find that people a lot of times they're waiting. I mean, Christians, we're we're especially bad at this because we believe that God has a will, right? And what we want to do is find God's will for our life, right? So we're always looking for God's will for our life. And we're putting life on hold, trying to find God's will for our life so we can live. And while we're looking for the will, life just goes right on by. You know, life is what happens while you're sitting on the side waiting for life to happen. And before you know it, you turn around and you go, what happened to my life? Well, life is not a destination. <laughs> life is an adventure. Life's a journey. And every day is an adventure in life. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying to us in Philippians in these, these, what, 12 verses or so here at the end of the first chapter, just a tremendous word, and he's saying, look, if you're going to enjoy life no matter what, I got four little essentials that, that you need to get in you in order for this to happen. These come right out of these verses. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me see. Let me see if I can give you the first one here. Yeah. All right. If I'm going to enjoy life no matter what, I'm going to have to have a different perspective. Now, by that, I mean a different way of looking at things. Because if you're going to enjoy life and not just simply endure life, uh, you are going to have to change the way you look at things, your perspective. The Apostle Paul, I said, was in prison. He was chained to a Roman guard on each side. Big old Roman guard. And hey, these weren't just any Roman soldiers, by the way. These were Roman soldiers that would serve as a, as a special guard like this for 12 years. And then they would become part of the, the, uh, the hierarchy of the kingdom. In other words, they, these guys that Paul was changed to were the future leaders of the Roman Empire. And every day, you know, probably twice a day, they changed this guard and changed another one and changed this one and changed another one. And, and, and his life was basically a series of a couple of people. You know, Paul, the Apostle Paul always wanted to go to Rome. If you've read any of the New Testament, any of the writings that Paul, in the books that Paul wrote, which is half of the New Testament, and you look at them and you read, you'll find out Paul has this desire. He really thinks God wants him to go to Rome. He said, one of these days, man, I'm going to go to Rome, 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 Rome. And you know what I think Paul had in his mind? I think Paul had in his mind the Roman Colosseum packed with people. And he's standing down kind of in the middle of the Roman Colosseum, and he's looking up at all the people around. And he's going, I'm Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ, and I came to give you the good news that you don't have to die and go to hell, that Jesus has made a way through his blood to wash you and make you clean. How about that? Yeah! You know. I think that's what he imagined would happen. Well, he's in Rome, all right. And he is preaching the gospel. But he's not in the Colosseum. He's in the jailhouse. But not under the jailhouse. But now just to show you how amazing God is, I mean, he chains to the Apostle Paul every day a future leader of the Roman Empire I mean, just as soon as these guys finish up this assignment, you know, they may be moving into the palace to lead certain parts of the Roman Empire. And they have been chained to the Apostle Paul. I'm wondering which one was the prisoner, you know? 
Can you imagine what Paul taught into their life and said into their life and challenged them into their life? that they would go out from there and become impressed by whatever he had been saying to them all those years. Here's this prison down prisoner down in the prison, man. And he's, he's happy and he's joyful. And he talks about God, this and God, that, and about the Lord Jesus and about how God changed your life and how to see things and how to be joyful and how to be great and what you need to think and what you need to plan and how you're never a prisoner when Jesus has set you free. And I mean, I mean, and these are the future leaders of the Roman empire. So even though he's not in the Colosseum, he is affecting the empire. But you know, he'd been in, like I said, he'd been in prison two years before this on a trumped up charge. I mean, basically just a like a little religious charge of some kind. And he had been in prison for two years, basically awaiting, uh, you know, uh, movement to Rome so he could be tried so you're in jail two years and you hadn't even had a trial. I mean, that'll make you bitter, right? I mean, that's something to be mad about. Yeah. That's something to look at everybody that's working for the government saying, you bunch of dogs. That would be his perspective. And then, on top of that, when they got ready to take him to Rome, they put him on a ship that sailed out of the port, and it, about in the middle of the Mediterranean, this ship runs into a storm that we now know as a hurricane. They said it was a great wind called Eurachlodon. We call them Katrina and Camille. And, you know. But it, they ran into Eurachlodon, and it sunk the ship, broke it all into pieces, and they washed up on a little island out in the Mediterranean, uh, boards from the boat. I mean, the boat just broke into all pieces, and they, they just happened to, I mean, God, they just floated up on an island. And this island was inhabited by uh, some native people of the island, and they had a king in, on the island, and uh, they wanted to take Paul to the king. You know, I mean, it was, this was a big deal. And, and so Paul's gathering up some wood to build a little bonfire on the, on the, on the beach and got bitten by a snake. And the snake was so poisonous. And the Bible said he shook it off in the fire. The thing latched onto him and he shook it off in the fire. And, and, and these people on this island said, man, anybody who ever gets bitten by that snake is going to die right now. I mean, not even a question. He's gone, man. And this is what they began to say. They said, what? You know, look at this guy. What kind of sinner is this guy? What kind of an evil person is this guy? He, he survives a shipwreck only to be bitten by a snake and die on the island. I mean, his God must be really angry at him. And Paul didn't die. And the people looked at him, and they said, he's got to be a God. Paul said, no, I'm not a God, but I know the one who is. And everybody on the whole island came to the Lord. And they finally sent another ship from Rome and took him to Rome and put him into prison where he is now chained and writing what, I'm, what we're reading. I'm, I'm just saying perspective. See? I mean, the way you look at life. If I'm going to be able to enjoy life no matter what, I've got to look at life differently than I normally look at life. As a matter of fact, listen, I, I, I kept this so long. You see this little deal right here? That thing must be about 25 years old. I clipped it out of a little magazine one day, uh, evidently a long, long time ago. Man, this thing is so old, really. Let me read it to you, all right? Dear Mom and Dad. <laughs> it's always a good start, right? Dear Mom and Dad, I, I, I'm sorry to be so long in writing. Unfortunately, all of my stationery was destroyed the night our dorm was set on fire by the demonstrators. I'm out of the hospital now, and the doctors say that my eyesight should return sooner or later. The wonderful boy, Bill, who rescued me from the fire, kindly offered to share his little apartment with me until the dorm is rebuilt. That's nice, isn't it? He comes from a good family, so you won't be surprised when I tell you that we're going to be married. In fact, since you've always wanted to be a, a, a grandparent, 
You'll be glad to know that you'll be grandparents next month. P.S. Please discard, please disregard the above practice in English composition. There was no fire. I haven't been in the hospital. I'm not pregnant, and I don't even have a steady boyfriend. But I did get a D in French and an F in chemistry. <laughs> and, uh, and I just wanted to be sure you received this with the proper perspective. <laughs> Absolutely. All of a sudden, that D and F don't look so bad, does it? <laughs> no. See, that, yeah, that's perspective. That's, that's what perspective is. And so Paul said, if you're going to enjoy life no matter what, you're going to have to have a different perspective. Let me show you. Paul says, but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. In other words, Paul is saying, look, you know, all that stuff looked like it was terrible and looked like it was the end of the earth and the greatest devastation I've ever seen in my life. But let me tell you, you know what it did? It actually has worked out to spread the gospel further than it would have spread if all that stuff hadn't happened. Man, I got a whole island full of people that came to the Lord. We'll see in heaven one day that we never would have seen them if I hadn't been shipwrecked and preached the gospel to them. And these guards right here, boy, they're going to go out and they're going to, their whole lives are going to be affected. Their children, their family, the Roman government's going to be affected. And so he's saying, look, guys, hey, I've got a different perspective now. This thing's worked out good for the gospel uh, uh, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Uh, in, in other words, on your, on your notes that I wrote to you, what happens if you live life from this perspective? What happens if you live life like this? Like, hey, this is, this is a different way to look at things. This is not so bad. This, is, this, can, this can work out. This can work out. If you live life like that, look at what happens. People who don't know the Lord are going to be impressed by what, what you do. I mean, really, have you ever wondered, why, why doesn't God just take me to heaven the minute I get saved? I mean, really, that would make sense, right? I mean, if we're living on earth in order to, ha to have a chance to make a decision about where we're going to be in eternity, which is the rest of forever, okay? <laughs> This is like this forever. Eternity is like this. All right, I make a decision to come to Christ. Why doesn't Jesus just take me on right then? That would be the safest thing to do, right? Because you let me go, I might, you know, what am I going to do? You know, what, what am I going to do? Am I going to do what I said I'd never do anymore? And all? Yeah, probably. But, but the reason he doesn't is because of stuff like this right here so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that I'm not in prison in Rome. Rome is chained to me. It has become evident that the only reason I'm in prison is because of the ministry of Christ. That's what he said. I'm in jail for Jesus. <laughs> now, next time you get in jail, well, I hope you won't ever get in jail again, but if, if you... Um, if you find yourself there in jail, look at the guards and say, you know, I'm in jail for Jesus. You know that, right? <laughs> well, they'll say, get out of here, would you? And, and, uh, and, and look, what else he says? Second thing, and most of the brethren in the Lord. Who is that? Other Christians. So the reason God doesn't just take me right on when I get saved is because I can have an impact on other people who need the Lord and I can have impact on people who already know the Lord. Most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. People are looking at Paul's life and saying, man, if Paul can do that in prison, surely I can do it walking down the street out here and nobody's trying to hurt me, you know. Surely I can say something about the Lord in my home to my children and my wife. I can say something to my neighbor next door about the Lord if he can suffer in prison over all of this stuff. See, it just gives, it just boosts the confidence of everybody around you, whether they're safe or not safe. So God keeps us here on earth. And so here's the perspective. Our perspective, this is Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to, the, to his purpose. That's, that's just basically saying, look, when bad stuff happens to you, and I want to, I want to say this to you because I'm about to say something else to you that I know you're going to 
misunderstand if I don't make this point to you, all right? I know you're going to go out of here and say, oh, Pastor Sam, all right. Um, this verse does not say everything that happens to you is good. You, you're right. You're, re you're reading it the right way, right? It says that God works all the stuff that happens to you together. And when he works it together, then it comes out to the good. Not everything. Man, there's some horrible things that can happen to you. There's some bad things that can happen to you. And God's not sitting there in heaven pushing a button and saying, all right, let's see... Uh, they're not doing right. All right, what shall we do? Okay, here's a catastrophe. Boom. All right, you should be doing good. All right, learn to do good. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. Oh, look at them blowing up at that sweet baby. Good night. That's a terrible thing. Boop. Uh, we got a little diabetes right here. Boop. Uh, all right, I know it's not pleasant, but that'll teach you to be more patient. You need it. I mean, that's the way people's concept of God is a lot of times. That's what they think. When, look, when, when I say God has a purpose for everything that happens in your life, don't you automatically think, okay, he makes everything happen that happens in my life? I mean, don't you automatically think, okay, if God has a purpose and you, something bad happens, I say, oh, baby, that's all right. God has a purpose for your life. Isn't that basically saying that whatever just happened, no matter how horrible it is, that it was part of God's purpose? And I'm just trying to say, no, it's not. That's what I'm trying to say to you. I'm telling you that not everything that happens in your life is God's purpose for your life. You make choices. Sometimes you're dumb. Sometimes you're wrong. Sometimes you're uninformed. Have you ever said, have you ever made a decision and then look back and said, well, if I had known that, well, you weren't evil. You were just uninformed, but, but it's still bad. I mean, that something bad came out of it and, and that's not God's will, but what God, God is so powerful and so mighty and actually so good. God is so good that he even takes the mess ups of your life and makes something great out of it. God takes the most horrible catastrophes, the most ridiculous things, the, the ha most harmful uh, junk in the world, and even though that was not his purpose for you and that was not his will for you, you stepped in it anyway, and now he's going to rescue from that by working some bunch of other stuff together so that it works out to your benefit. And God's so good that that's it. Now, see, that's your perspective. That's what you see life from. You want to enjoy life every day, no matter what? That's the perspective. No matter what happens, man, I can trust God. God has a purpose behind my problems. In other words, my, that purpose behind my problems is that I can be a better man. I can be a greater man. God's going to take it and do something good with it. All right, let me give you another one. I got to hurry. Um, for all you visitors, I, I, I'm always in a hurry, so don't. Somebody said, what does it mean when you say, Pastor, you're in a hurry? I say, we're in nothing, but it gives a little comfort to everybody, I guess. He's not going to preach forever. All right, <laughs> number two, second essential, number two, I need a priority to live by. All right, number one, I need to see life differently than, I, than I've been seeing it. All right, number two, now... I've got to have, I've got to separate the essentials of life from the, oh, what shall we call them, um, the happenstance of life. All right, all right, I have trouble telling treasure from trash. I don't know if you guys do. Uh, that's why I don't really go to yard sales. Um, <laughs> I know that some of you guys in here are professional yarders. You know, you, you go to yard sales uh, for a living. I mean, you love it, and you're great at it. And you, but you know why you are? Because you can tell what's valuable and what's not valuable. See, I can't, I'm just saying, I, can't, I have trouble separating what's valuable and what's not valuable. I guarantee you that I threw away, no, I probably didn't throw it away. I probably used it as a flapper on my bike spokes, Mickey Mantle's rookie baseball card. I probably did. 
I, how much would that be worth? How would you like to have, how would you like to now have like a 1964 Mustang that had been in a, in a, in a garage somewhere and, and, and wasn't worn out? Oh, you could, what could you, ooh. I mean, see, we, we, we have trouble separating treasure from trash. Some things that we call trash are really treasure. Man, they're worth everything if we just held on to them and it would be so valuable. What I'm just saying is life like this. Paul says, all right, look, there are some things that are essential. There are priorities. There are big things and little things. And I, I have to separate out in my life and I have to decide, okay, this is one of those big things and, and, and this is one of those small things and, and, and I'm going to let this go because... I mean, how can I say? Basically, you're going to live life either based on your problems or your priorities. Either your life is going to go up and down with the problems in your life, and, and you chase them. You chase the problems. Have you ever looked back at your life and found out how much your life has lived just trying to uh, uh, avoid problems or fix problems or deter from problems. <laughs> you know, and what's that? The problems are just leading you right along. I mean, you, your life goes up and down like a thermometer, boom, 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 because you're living on the highs and lows of, of the problems of your life. And I'm going to tell you something. You have an enemy in the spirit world called the devil that is going to really try to load you down with as many problems as possible. Problems everywhere. So if you're going to enjoy life, no matter what, then you're going to have to decide what is important. And then you're going to have to live life based on what is important, not on what gives you a problem, because problems are going to come and go. But what's important stays the same. You know, I've had people in church and, of course, I've been pastoring so long, I guess I've had a little bit of everything. But I've had people in church that have come to church, seriously. Now, you, you'll find this hard to believe. But I've had people that have come to church with problems. Oh, I mean, mm, terrible. Marriage falling apart. Uh, children spread out wild as a buck. Uh, in jail, prison, on drugs. I mean, just, just, just terrible situations. And they came to church. And then they came the next, and they came, and they came. And after about three or four months or so, their life began to look a little different. They began to see things a little bit in a different way. They, they began to have more thought about what they did and had a little more discipline and stuff like that. In other words, life kind of began to turn around for them a little bit. And then just as soon as the problem was gone, you never saw them again until you got a call one day that said, I'm in trouble. But I said, yeah, you know why? Why'd you quit? I mean, if it's doing you good, why would you quit? It'll keep on doing you good. I'm just saying that's a priority. But when the pressure's off, it's not a priority anymore. Hey, going to the beach, man, that's a priority. You know, hey, my family's here. We're going to the river. All right. Bless the Lord. That's a big deal. And, and, and see, you, you, you have a priority to live by. All right, let me just show you some verses. I know that's enough of that. Some indeed, this was Paul's problem right here. Here's his problem. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. Okay, so some of the people are out in the street mocking Paul, and some of them are doing it trying to embarrass him, trying to make him feel bad and say, you know, make fun of him. And then some are doing it because they have literally believed some of the stuff that Paul said. And so they're happy in there. So some are doing it for real. Some are doing it just to get on his nerves. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. In other words, they want to make prison life worse by making me know they're out there mocking me. Is there anything that makes you madder than having somebody mock you? Uh, or, or criticize you in some way, uh, especially somebody that loves you, somebody that's, you know, and they just, they're making fun of you. Phew, boy, that's, that's, that's tough. The, the, but that's what Paul's having, and, and they want to add affliction to my change. 
but the latter one out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. Okay, here's the conclusion then. What then? Okay, some are doing it for good, some are doing it for bad. Some want to make me mad, some want to do it for... All right, so he says, all right, what? What then? What, what do we do? What is it? What do we think? What happened now? Only that in every way, he says, <laughs> okay, here's what I'm going to conclude. I don't care whether they're making fun of me preaching Jesus or whether they're doing it for real because they love Jesus. I don't care. All that matters to me is that Jesus gets preached out there on the streets. You know why? Because Paul's priority was Jesus. Hello? If your priority is Jesus, then you don't care if they're mocking you because you are not your priority. The trouble with us is most of the time we are our priority. What's going to happen to me? What's going to be best for me? How am I going to make it better? How am I going to get more? We are involved in ourselves. But Paul says, look, it doesn't matter to me. I rejoice. And yes, I will rejoice. I'm going to rejoice now. And every time I think about it, I'm going to rejoice. And so it, it, it's a priority to live by. It will change our life, our perspective. This is uh, from Proverbs 3, 6. In everything you do, put God first, and he'll direct you and crown your efforts with good success. That's not a good word from the Lord. In everything you do, put God first. And the stuff that's, that you do then will be, be better for you. Uh, the lesson, focus on what really counts. All right, let me give you a third essential. Here's a third essential. I need a power to live on. Living wears you out, right? Living life. How many of you are tired right now? <laughs> I am. Okay. Yeah. You work hard, don't you? You go to work every day. When you come home, you're tired. When you go to bed at night, you're tired. When you get up, you're tired. Mm -hmm. When you're at work, you're tired. When you get home, you're tired again. So you just stay, <clears throat> stay that way. And so Paul said, okay, if you're going to enjoy life no matter what, you are going to have to be infused with a power source. It's like, it's like a commercial. I, I mean, like a little cartoon. I, I tried to find it, but I, I didn't know enough words to put in the search for it. If some of you can find this by what I describe, don't do it now in church, but, but wait and do it. And if you find it, send it to me because I want it. I'd love, to, I'd love to be able to pop this up on the screen right now is what I'm saying to you. It was a little cartoon, and it was a, a woman standing at the door, and she had a baby in this arm, and she had like two or three babies around her feet, and her hair was frazzled down in her face like this. And you could look behind her, and it, was, it looked like, you know, furniture all muffed up and stuff laying on the floor. So, and, and she's standing at the door like this, and there's, a, there's this guy taking a pole and talking to her. And he says, uh, says ma'am, uh, what, what, what do you mean you're confused? Uh, all I asked you was, uh, do you live here? And I thought to, my, I thought to myself, do you, I don't know whether I live here or not. Is I, might, I exist here. I stay here. I'm here with these kids, but whether you would call that a life, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm confused about that. And I thought about our lives when I saw that little, that little cartoon like that. I thought, okay, life can wear you out. And when you are worn out, life doesn't look the same. When you are worn out, you say things you don't mean. You do things you wouldn't normally do. I mean, life can really be tough. So Paul says, okay, if you're going to enjoy life, no matter what, you've got to see life in a different way. You've got to decide what's important to you and start living life according to what's important to you. And you've got to be empowered so that you can live a life like this. So what is it that empowers you? Let me, let me put this up first to you. No, I didn't have it. I don't even have it on there. I'm sorry. Two things empower you. Let me go back to the verses. For I know that this, that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul says, all right, what empowers me? It empowers me to know that you guys are praying for me. So if I need power in my life, one of the things that God says will bring power into my life is to know that other people are praying for you. 
Does it encourage you when you know people are praying for you? I mean, really, when somebody comes up to you and says, hey, man, we remembered you last night at prayer meeting. We've been, we're praying for that situation that's going on there because we know it's really bothering you. We're praying for you, man. We want God to do the best. Or when you come down here on Sunday morning, you stand down here in the front, and we have some people that come by and anoint you with a little bit of oil while we're all praying and saying, God, whatever's going on in their life, would you please work in there? God, get in there and do something on their life, whatever it is. Give them some patience, some security about it. Let them know you're there. Let them know you're on the job. No matter what happens, Lord, may they be able to accept this and walk with this and work with this. We love them. We want the best. I mean, does that help you? Does that empower you? Does that give you a little oomph? You know, sure it does. And he says, so he says, okay, where am I going to get this power? I get it through the prayer of other people and look at the last line and supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ. In other words, the Holy Spirit of God comes into my life and empowers me to to be able to accomplish and to work and to do the things that I need to do. So if I need a new power, more power in my life, I've got two things that come in to help me, the prayers of other people and, and the help of God's Spirit. And so this is the answer to your personal energy crisis, Philippians 4. It, it's in the last chapter of this book. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That was the verse Justin put on his little baseball hat when he was pitching and Blowing everybody down, man. Had a little, he had it written right up there. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And when he was on the mound, you could watch him. He was just like this. He was on the mound. He'd get up there. He'd get on that rubber, you know, like that. He'd look over there at me so I could tell him what pitch to throw. <laughs> and then, and then, he'd, then you'd see his eyes look up at the brim of that cap just like that. And he was saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then he would wind up. And buddy, she was on the way. <laughs> but that's the point of the thing. Nothing can overwhelm me with God's power in my life. So here I am. I want to enjoy life no matter what, okay? I'm looking at life from God's point of view and not mine. I've decided what's important in life, and it's not me. And now I, I, I know where to go to for my power. And let me just give this one last thing. Once I get all that straight, I need a purpose to live for. You know the reason why people don't live life, really? What's the purpose? What am I living for? What, 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 what's, <laughs> I mean, I told you a while ago, we all believe God has a will, right? You believe God has a will? When you say, is that God's will? Or you say, that's not God's will? Or, or you use that phrase? You're saying that God has a will, right? Well, we believe, we know God has a will. We know God has a will. You know how we know? Because the Bible says that he's not willing that any of us should perish, but that all of us would come to repentance. God said, it's not my will that you die and be separated from me forever. My will is that you would invite me in and come live with me forever. That's my will. So people spend all their life looking for the will of God as if it's a treasure hunt. Have you ever noticed this? You ever, have you ever seen people talk about God's will? They go to church and they say, man, i got to find the will of God. If I find the will of God, that's going to be the place I need to live, man. I'm going to tell you, if I'm in the will of God, I'm powerful. I'm, I'm, I'm with God. I'm a... And then they set out to find the will of God by looking for it. Okay, where is it? Where is the will of God? Well, I mean, I'm talking about the will of God for me. Okay, well... Where is the will of God for you? Well, I hadn't found it yet, but I'm looking for it. And I almost found it one time. And it's almost like, okay, there's a treasure map, and the Bible contains the clues into the treasure map. And so if I read the Bible enough, I'll go like five steps forward, two steps over. Okay, then the next Sunday, okay, I'll say one step back, four steps up. To, you know, and I'm just following the map, trying to get the Bible to tell me how to get to the will of God, because I have become convinced that if I get in the will of God, life's going to be great for me. But it's not really going to be great until I get in the will of God, because the preachers have already told me this. So I got to get in the will of God, and I'm looking for it. And it, you know, and it's, it's almost like when I get near it, 
if I'm not living just exactly right, God moves it. I mean, good night, man. I was right at it. And then he just moved it somewhere. Where did it? That's the way they talk, people talk about the will of God. May I tell you that that is not how it is at all? God's will is that you live the life he created you to live. That he empowered you with certain things. He gave you a personality. He gave you a mind. He gifted you by his Holy Spirit. There are things that he has created you that, to do normally and naturally in life. Here's what I say. Here's what I say. What do you like to do? And what, do you, and, and when, and what happens? What is it that you do that when you do it, other people are blessed? That's good indications of exactly what God has for you in your life. I mean, if you, if you are basically antisocial and you hate people, don't be a salesman. <laughs> Find you a computer back there. Go to college, get a degree in computer technology, get in the back of a lab somewhere and never see a person. You'll be happier in the Lord. Will of God. That's will of God. But don't take one of those antisocial, put them on the counter, sales counter, and then take a salesman and put them back there in the back room somewhere. They'll go crazy. So the purpose, the purpose is what we're, what purpose? You know what Paul's purpose? This will be really easy because you, you'll see it. This is the most famous verse in, first, in Philippians. For, uh, Philippians 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, look, that's not a suicidal verse. I know some people look at that and say, man, I'm going to put that on my suicide note. No, this is not a suicide verse. This verse says, look, I'm not afraid to die. But it also says, I'm not afraid to live either. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to say to you that it takes more guts to live than it does to die. You know why you need Jesus so bad, really? I mean, can I just cut to the brass tacks for just one second? You know why you need Jesus so bad? Because you're going to wake up tomorrow. Yep. Yeah. yeah. You don't need him because he's probably going to come in the next five minutes and leave you behind. Because he's probably not. Now, I can't guarantee it, but he's probably not. I mean, the odds are he's not. And the odds are you're not going to die in a car crash on the way home. The odds are you're going to make it till tomorrow. You're going to wake up. And that's why you really need him. Because you're going to have to live in this crazy old world another day. And you got to survive. And Paul said, you know, I'm not afraid to live in this world and I'm not afraid to die. Because I know where I'm going when I die. And, 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 but the point I want you to see here for a moment is that Paul says, my purpose is Jesus Christ. For me to live is Fill in the blank. Christ. That's what he says. Now, let me ask you, what would you put in the blank? For me to live is money. For me to live is uh, popularity. For me to live is power. Man, I want to be the boss. For me to live is pleasure. Man, I don't ever get to do anything fun. What would you put in there? Well, that's your purpose. I'm just saying, if you want to know what your purpose is, what you would put in that blank is what your purpose is. And what Paul is saying is, if you want to, if you want to live and enjoy life every day, your purpose needs to be bigger than that. Because that will not last. You hear what I'm saying to you? That six-pack you working so hard for, it looks good for a minute, but you can't maintain that thing. It's going to go away someday. Mine's dropped down. I used to have one, but I, I got about a, you know, I don't know what here now, but it ain't a six-pack anymore. So what, what, what? This stuff that, that, that is, we say, I mean, that is our purpose, man, it won't even last through this life, much less the, the life to come. Let me, let me give you one wise tip. All right. If you want to invest in something valuable, invest in something that will outlive you. 
Invest in something that'll be here when you're gone. And I'm just saying that your popularity and your possessions and your power and, you know, whatever, that's not going to be here, even through this life, much less past this life. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. Hey, that's a big thing. That's a big purpose right there. My purpose is that whatever happens in my life, it makes Jesus look better. It makes Jesus the answer to somebody's life. It exposes the fact that I am completely dependent on Jesus, that he is the total reason for who I am. I'm not just a nice guy. I'm the way I am because Jesus Christ lives in me. I'm not just a, a smart person. I'm this way because Jesus Christ lives inside of me. So that's my purpose of life, not to show you how smart I am or how rich I am or how powerful I am, but to show you Jesus. That's a purpose. And I'm just saying, if you're going to be happy every day, you're going to have to get a purpose. Now, if you don't get one, we know what it is, you. You know, you're, you're the purpose of your life, right? For me to live is Christ. Now, these are some of the verses that he said, but if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. You remember he said, for me to live is Christ and die is gain. He says, but if I live on, if I'm to stay here, uh, the fruit, uh, the people that come to the Lord, the people that are taught and trained, the people that love God, the people I influence, and blah, blah, blah. All right, that's fruit, the fruit of his life. That, that, it, that'll be fruit for my labor. Uh, yet what I shall choose, I, I, I can't tell. For I'm, I'm, I'm hard-pressed, he said, between the two, having the desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I mean, if he goes on, he can't write great stuff like this. He can't teach. He can't talk to you about Jesus. He can't, you know, he's, if he's in heaven, it's great for him, bad for us. We wouldn't have half of our New Testament. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you, with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So the Apostle Paul said, hey, just keep on praying for me, would you? And keep on believing that God's going to do something in this. And if he gets me out of this prison, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to see you and I'm going to hug your neck and I'm going to tell you thank you for praying for me and being with me. But if I don't see you here, I'm going to see you on the other side. Yeah. That is a perspective. That's a perspective you can live by. And that's, what, and that's what the Word of God teaches us about life. That's not somebody's 12-step uh, program or some, uh, you know, be successful book. That's the Word of God that's telling us how we can enjoy life regardless of what happens. And Jesus Christ is the key to that. So, all right.